Geoquit, hello. Welcome to the podcast series of the Center for Irish Studies at Villanova University. My name is Joseph Lennon, Emily C. Riley, Director of the Center. And I'm Jennifer Joyce, Associate Director and Curator of this series. We appreciate the support from our many donors, especially a generous grant from the Connolly Foundation. This podcast series aims to reflect aspects of Irish studies through the nine different academic disciplines that are taught through Villanova's Center for Irish Studies. Our faculty and students will engage in discussions with distinguished thinkers, artists, writers, academics, political leaders, and other campus visitors. We are very excited for our second season of this podcast. Our episodes this year explore current issues about race and dive into traditional song and story. Thank you so much for listening. And if you are looking for more Irish Studies events, please join us virtually this year for a rich menu of programming. You can follow us on social media, find us at our website, or email us at irishstudies at villanova.edu. Jeeve, I am James O'Connell. I am the 2021-22 Fulbright Irish Language Instructor here at Villanova University. And joining me in this episode of the podcast, of the Villanova Centre for Irish Studies podcast, is Philip Arneil, a Belfast-born photographer, researcher, and I'd like to say a friend of many talents. Philip has studied and worked in Scotland, Egypt and Japan, and is currently conducting his research through Ulster University's Belfast School of Art. So hello, Philip. Hello. You're very welcome here today. And I suppose, could we begin maybe by asking you to talk a little bit about your journey to date and how you've come to be where you are and and the different experiences you've had over the years? Wow. I mean, that might take the whole episode in itself. I'm not sure anyone wants to hear it, but uh, (laughs) the the shortened version, uh, I suppose the Cliff Notes version is, um, I was born in Belfast, as you said. Um, I uh, went to Scotland to study. I always had the sense I wanted to leave Belfast. Um, I grew up during what's known um, rather uh, perhaps inappropriately as the Troubles, which was essentially a uh, a, a form of civil war between uh, warring political factions in, in Northern Ireland over the future of Northern Ireland, whether it should remain part of the UK or become part of the United Ireland. Um, and uh, I always just wanted to leave, really. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I took the first opportunity, went to Scotland uh, to study. Uh, and after that, then um, very fortunately, I suppose, got a job in Japan uh, working in um, Japanese junior high schools as a as an assistant English teacher. Um, And that was kind of where my journey started, I suppose, in some ways. Went to Japan, stayed there for about 10 years, uh, decided to leave um, and do something else. Ended up Mm -hmm. in Cairo, uh, living on a houseboat on the River Nile, which actually last week the Egyptian government finally uh, destroyed. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, so those are now gone. And after about a year, it wasn't quite uh, what I was looking for. I ended up back in Japan. Um, and throughout that time, I was teaching in, in a various sort of guises. I taught kindergarten, primary school, uh, university, and I ended up back again in, in an international school as a primary school teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in 2017, I decided to move uh, back to Ireland and study acting. Um, I ended up in Dublin uh, as, a, as a citizen of both countries. I have passports for, for both the Republic of Ireland and the UK. Um, I stayed there for four years and uh, 30 years after I left, I ended up back in um, Belfast where I was born, slightly different side of the city to where I grew up, but uh, that's where I am now. And as you said, I'm I'm doing some research. Um, I'm studying a PhD through creative practice at the Belfast School of Art, which is part of Ulster University, which is one of the two universities in Belfast, the other being Queen's University. Uh, And that's where I am at the moment. Okay, wow, that that was a, a very sweeping uh, take on, on a, a life story there, but thank you very <laughs> much for that. Um, yeah, so it, I, you, it's interesting, I think, that you've had, you've experienced with many different cultures and, of course, coming from Northern Ireland to Japan is a, is a big transition and, and coming back, I'm sure you brought, you, you must have gained a lot from living in Japan and seeing new things um, there. I suppose just before I, I throw it back to you, I'd mention your photography a little bit. I know um, that's your main body of work, perhaps it might you might you might call it. And um, I see from your website, it descri- you describe your practice as exploring liminal and interstitial spaces, insider outsider dynamics, and also ethnographic issues of a place and identity. And I'm wondering, can you describe maybe what that means to you? <laughs> 
Well, I'm trying to I'm trying to think who wrote that. Uh, I think it was me, but um, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose uh, what I find with this PhD research is that a lot of things that I've photographed in the past are sort of coming back um, to. I, I suppose it feels somewhat like a process of joining the dots. So I'm looking even at work that I've done maybe, you know, 15 or 20 years ago and, and starting to see the connections more. And I suppose that's part of being forced to look for uh, theoretical underpinnings and, you know, uh, a more holistic view of, of your work. Mm-hmm. I think as a photographer, you tend to sort of do certain projects. Uh, you throw yourself into them. All photographers work differently, but sometimes I work in short bursts. You do something over a period of time, perhaps you get a chance to exhibit it. If you're lucky, you maybe get to publish uh, a book or, a, or some sort of booklet uh, with the images or, or get them published somewhere. Uh, and then you kind of move on to something else. But I suppose there is always a, a through line. Um, and I think for me, the insider-outsider dynamic is, is probably... Um, the main thing I've always been interested in this kind of idea of, of these sort of interstitial spaces. I mean, I feel and have always felt myself, my own identity as which is, is, is a Protestant growing up in quite a religious, I suppose. I know even the term evangelical has different meanings in different mm-hmm. contexts, but certainly in, in a very Bible based practicing Christian household and then growing up in the Protestant tradition as well, very much politically, um, you know, believing and being taught that, that, Northern Ireland was an integral part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Um, but it never quite sat with me perfectly, I suppose. And I never was able to sort of throw myself completely into that. Then going away, obviously, you're challenged by different things that you come across, uh, mm-hmm. other cultures, other ways of doing things. And then, of course, Japan, mm-hmm. again, famously, is, is probably one of those cultures where, um, you know, even within Japanese culture, there's very much an inside and an outside. A lot of the language is constructed around this idea of being either in or out. And then as a Mm. foreigner living in Japan, even more so you're on the outside. Um, And then, you know, you live there, uh, you you develop a life there, you you make friends there, you learn the language. And so this gives you levels of access, but also you're consciously aware of the fact that you'll never really truly be part of that culture. You'll never be on the Mm. inside or in the inner sanctum, I suppose. And so I think a lot of my work is, is, based around this idea of, of having some kind of insider credentials, but also somehow being on the outside and, and still looking in or looking back in uh, at a culture that I suppose on paper, at least, or in theory, that you could claim some sort of ownership or understanding yeah. of, yeah. but never quite um, being there. And, and in terms of the autoethnographic um, angle, what I'm exploring at the moment is this idea of writing semi-fictionally I suppose around my experiences and my reflections and trying to blend that with academic writing or or more traditional academic writing and seeing how that works by putting those two together I've always had an interest in writing I've always been encouraged by people to write more and so this is kind of giving me an opportunity I think to bring all these things together okay it's it's a fascinating idea. I know it make I've heard the line. I'm I don't know where it comes from, but there's the idea that who can England know who only England knows, and this idea that you can't really know your own culture, your own identity, your own people without being a little removed from it. Um, I don't know if that's something that resonates with you at all, but it's something that seems interesting. And and I don't know. It's, yeah, I think I think very much so. I mean. Certainly in my own experience, you know, I remember going to Japan um, as a, at the time as a man of 22 years old, mm-hmm. um, barely a man, I suppose, in, in, in a lot of my life experience. But, you know, we, part of the first month of orientation of teaching in schools evolved essentially going to different Japanese junior high schools and often teaching very disinterested students um, in English about yourself. And it was a self-introduction lesson. Mm-hmm. And I remember very clearly, you know, coming, talking about, I'm from the United Kingdom and I'm British and, you know, people saying because of the the, the nuances of language and, and how countries are sometimes translated saying, oh, you're, you're English. And, I, yeah. and, you know, whether you're Irish or Northern Irish or however you define, you generally tend to not define yourself as English for sure, mm-hmm. you know, and that, mm-hmm. that to me feels like something very different to, to being British, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I would say, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not English. No, 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 I'm, I'm British. And so, but, but, 
and you know you met yeah. with this kind of glazed stare so then you kind of start from that challenge you know you start to say well i'm northern irish and then people say well what is that is that a is that a place and you're like well you know that's that that's that's a difficult one to answer <laughs> so yeah. over the period of 20 years you know i went defining myself as british and left kind of defining myself as as irish and i think mm -hmm. whatever way you define i think once you step outside you know growing up in somewhere like northern ireland uh, and then particularly with the political um, situation at the time with the troubles, you know, it, it it's sort of in some ways all consuming, you know, it's or, or it's very much a part of the fabric of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And then you go to another country and you're able to look back and, and you think to yourself, well, you know, this is a tiny little island within an island mm -hmm. and nobody really cares too much about it. I mean, albeit there was, there was global recognition and global knowledge at least that there was something happening in Northern Ireland you know there was there was mm -hmm. there was violence and and these kind of awful atrocities that were happening but yet you know it just seems so small and so insignificant and, and I think you know stepping out of any situation but looking back at your country from afar I think is very much um you know something that's that's a valuable thing and I, I suppose in some ways I'm going through a different thing having spent you know a large part of my adult life in Japan mm -hmm. I'm now back where I started looking back at Japan in a different way as well so it's kind of an interesting um an interesting way to be approaching you know the the, the kind of the the two major sections of my life today you know yeah it's uh, really fascinating to hear you talk about it in that way I'm interested also your your project Tokyo Jazz Joints um, I've heard it, I've read it described as exploring the vanishing world of Japanese jazz culture. Why do you think the liminal um, boundaries, tr tr thresholds or transitions have been an interest to you in your work? Because obviously that's something that was in is, is a main theme in your work on Tokyo jazz joints. But it seems like something that is recurrent in, in your work. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I, I remember very distinctly um, one of the first couple of days that I was in Japan uh, before I'd even been shipped out to, to where I was going to be working and um, in an area of Shinjuku, which is, you know, has this sort of a slightly, it certainly was very much a bohemian area and back in the 60s and and you know a lot of countercultural movements and spaces based there it also has this kind of organized crime um association with it and even today a lot of japanese people will will sort of you know bulk slightly at the mention of shinjuku mm -hmm. and we were happened to be staying in a hotel me and, and a cohort of people that were all going out for the same program um, and, you know, we I remember very clearly you going into trying to go into a bar, a uh, particular one of these small bars and just someone very quickly coming to the door and, and making this X sign with their arms, which mm -hmm. you see a lot in Japan. And basically the reason we were not being allowed in was because we were foreigners, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there there is in Japan very much like this idea of a threshold, you know, when you go into most Japanese houses, uh, you'll find that there's a step up from the from the ground or the outside level. You know, you take off your shoes often uh, in a, an area called a genkan, and you kind of step up into the home. You know, mm -hmm. similarly, if you go to temples um, mm -hmm. and religious spaces like that, there's this. You know, there's a door frame, but it's it's not the door frame with three sides that we think of. It's actually four. You know, so the door kind of opens out of that space. So you know, you often have to step over this door frame that you wouldn't ordinarily expect to be. You know, at the when a door is open, you wouldn't expect there to be something there that you would have to step over or potentially trip over if you're not concentrating. And so, there is very much in Japan this sense of like crossing over into spaces, like mm -hmm. quite literally and physically. Um, mm -hmm. And I think. The Tokyo Jazz Joints project came about purely from a love of, of jazz music and mm -hmm. an interest in these spaces, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I could talk all night about, about these spaces, but the origin of them essentially is, is pre-war. Um, and after the, after the Second World War, they developed uh, very much into music listening spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and jazz, there are other types of music, it's still you know, classical being one example, but the majority of them uh, went with jazz, and that was there was various reasons for that. The American occupation of Japan after the war, 
um, famous jazz musicians uh, visiting in, in the early 60s and, and really opening the floodgates. And what they became was kind of specialist listening bars. Um, often the reasons were economic because actually, you know, Jap Japan was a very poor place after the war because of what had happened. It had been you know, mostly flattened. Large cities had been mostly flattened. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were the two atom bombs as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it was the place you wanted to go to hear music. You know, you, you couldn't necessarily afford to buy records yourself, uh, especially mm -hmm. records imported from, from America. So you could go there, have a coffee, listen to various records, maybe if you had the money, buy one and certainly, you know, not take any risks mm -hmm. and, and buy the wrong thing, you know, um, when you went to a record shop. And so these spaces are, you know, probably still today, Japan, Japan and, and jazz have a really, uh, jazz is a huge part of Japanese culture, but actually it also has this, kind of slightly countercultural uh, association with it even today. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you talk about these places, we call them jazz kisa, which is a, an abbreviation of kisa ten, which, which literally just means tea drinking shop, but it can also okay. be used in the vernacular as, as a coffee shop. Okay. You know, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable going into them. They're often in, in, in kind of seedier nightlife areas. Obviously, they have an association with, with late nights, you know, with, with drinking, smoking, and, you know, often kind of red light areas as well. And so there is a sense of stepping over into these spaces. And then on top of that, you know, you have these spaces that have been created over decades by, by the owners and, and they're beautiful spaces. They're, uh, they've developed this sort of natural sheen, this patina, yeah. you know, 30, 40 years of cigarette smoke on the ceiling. And, you know, yeah. there's, there's records and old uh, ticket stubs and signed photographs on the walls. And so, yeah. you, you know, there's a, if you're a fan of, of jazz in particular, and, you know, even if you're cognizant of Japanese culture, you kind of enter, enter them almost as a sacred space. Yeah. You know, you enter them with a reverence. And obviously, you know, that all religious spaces often have that sense of, you know, passing from, from, from kind of the profane into the sacred, you know, so there is yeah. this sense of it being a threshold. And for me, really, it was a combination of, of being a photographer, being a jazz fan, and obviously living in Japan and, I've been lucky enough through this project and my partner in the project, who's the researcher, James Catchpole, uh, you know, we've been to over 160 of these places now and we very much go as, as customers. We, we mm. go, go in, we order a drink, we chat to the owner. Eventually I will ask permission to take some photos. Um, and it's just kind of snowballed over the years since 2015. And, and, you know, I'm just happy to say, I just booked to take it back in October now that, that COVID restrictions are easing mm. uh, and I'm hoping to head back out and maybe photograph another 30 or 40 places. So, yeah. Um, yeah it's, I'm wondering, it's, sorry, sorry to cut across you there, not at all. but I'm just wondering is vanishing. I wonder what, what is the relevance of the, the idea that these jazz joints are maybe, are they as common as they used to be? Is it an aspect of Japanese culture that's, fading away or is it still as vibrant and, and growing and current as it used to be? I'd say probably the former. I mean, there are some signs that of a vibrancy and of a resurgence. Mm -hmm. what's, be, what's really interesting is that, yes, I mean, the project started, and, and again, this goes to a lot of my work actually, where it's about maybe capturing or preserving things. Mm -hmm. creating some sort of visual archive and, and Tokyo mm -hmm. Jazz Joints, the, the, its original raison d'etre was very much to photograph these places before they disappear because they are mm -hmm. disappearing. You know, some of them have been opened from the 50s and 60s. Uh, there's a lot less in Japan now than there were. You know, the owners are getting older, they're getting sick. There's not really any money in them. So very, very rarely do young people mm -hmm. or children want to take them over. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously tastes change and then there's always this kind of constant threat particularly in, in Japanese cities of gentrification you know yeah. Japan uh, particularly urban spaces renew very very quickly and there's there's a lack perhaps of sentimentality about like protecting certain spaces you know it's if it's old it needs to go and it needs to be refreshed and it needs to be renewed so they are vanishing what's been really interesting you know as I've got deeper into this project is that as they're disappearing in Japan there's more awareness of these spaces mm -hmm that exist in Japan, outside Japan. So there's a global interest now, um, you know, in these spaces. And actually it sort of coincides with the revival of vinyl because a lot of almost, you know, probably over 90% of these places are vinyl based. And so mm. with the resurgence of vinyl worldwide as a way of listening with the resurgence of like an interest in audio culture and also then, um, you know, listening spaces, because I think, 
this analog revolution in some ways is a reaction to you know the digitization that the intangibility of of digital music and so what we're seeing is you know places like rhinoceros in in berlin uh, black forest in buenos aires uh, spirit land in london uh, bar shiru in in oakland and california and, and and some other bars that we're becoming aware of that are opening up globally and they're not necessarily exact replicas of of japanese jazz uh, bars or, or coffee shops but they are taking that inspiration they're taking that respect that's there for those spaces and kind of putting them into their own local cultures and they're very much focused around that aesthetic and particularly mm. of course the music's at the center and this idea of listening to music as a something active mm. rather than it just being a, a sort of a background mm. uh distraction okay it's it's um as i say fascinating but it's interesting you talk about because i suppose when i i was preparing for this podcast what appeared to me was the idea of that these things were vanishing or that they were in decline and that they were maybe in need of preservation and so i suppose then i was wondering in my mind as i was looking at some of the work you're doing in relation to you know ulster protestant identity and issues around that that maybe there was a theme there in terms of transitions from things that were to maybe things that will be and um i wondered if that was a theme in in your work and i'll just maybe before i i finish there we can i can point the way towards your work on, on blood and thunder and ask as well how you might describe this project well this project came out of a of researching my family tree actually and, and i was doing a masters at the time and um uh, I had tracked down a, a, a lodge, as we call it here, but it, it's essentially a, there's a fraternal religious organization known as the Orange Order in Ireland, particularly in, in Northern Ireland, although it did have presence right across the island of Ireland before, before partition in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, it, there was a period of time when the membership would have been very high amongst Protestant men. Mm-hmm. Um, and as part of my family history, I sort of had tracked down this the lodge that my grandfather would have been in had he still been alive. And I contacted them and I walked uh, one of the largest parades um, in Northern Ireland, on the, which is on the 12th of July every year, traditionally, uh, with that lodge and photographed the experience. And actually what I learned from that was, even as someone who grew up here, I had had a whole misunderstanding of... Um, how parade culture worked because in actual fact what often people associate with is there there are these lodges of men quite somber often uh, wearing black clothes the famously bowler hats um, and, a, and a sort of an orange collarette which they put over their neck and, and sort of drapes down their front and they often walk in and and the the parade of these men is often punctuated by bands and as traditionally it would be flute bands there are sometimes also brass and accordion bands but uh, particularly in urban areas, it tends to be more flute bands. The reason being, of course, that you know you can learn a lot of tunes on a on a you know three note, four note tunes on a flute. So it's it's kind of a quick way. Uh, and and I suppose the closest thing in America would be, you know, kind of the marching band culture, these sort of military style bands that you often get at at, at sports events. And I realized at the time, and and I I came across a book uh, which is going to put me on the spot. I think it was Inside an Ulster inside uh, an Ulster marching band. I think I, I can check that reference for you, but it's by Dara McDonald. And uh, it really just opened my eyes because uh, as, a, as a Catholic journalist, he had attached himself to one of these Protestant uh, flute bands and he'd spent a year with them and written a book about it. And I realized through my own project that actually these bands and these lodges have a slightly fractious relationship at times what essentially happens is these more more often older men quite usually quite religious uh, very respectable if you like uh, hire these bands and there was always an association with these bands as being a bit more uh, lively um you know uh, perhaps less religious and certainly less conservative you know and and traditionally again certainly when i was growing up there would have been a lot of alcohol consumed during these parades or certainly at the end of the parade Um, And it definitely had a particular image. But one of the interesting things after the Good Friday Agreement was that the Parades Commission got involved in this whole marching culture. Mm -hmm. And actually what it did, 
inadvertently was create this kind of local scene of, of bands competing against each other. And it was quite distinct from the Orange Order, quite distinct from the, the, the traditional summer parades. They were actually competing all year round. And not only that, because of the new restrictions by the Parades Commission, uh, you know, there was a, a lot more attention being paid to things like uniforms, decorum, behaviour, all this sort of stuff. And the, the result of that had been this explosion of these bands in various housing estates and various areas right across the country and a very, very vibrant mm -hmm. scene where they were going, you know, one band would invite a, a load of other bands, they would gather, they would have a, a, a march, you know, and they'd try to outplay each other. By the end of the parade, then, you know, someone was awarded, you know, often you know best performance best uniforms etc and i suppose another result of that was that it was that it was pumping um you know money into the local economy you know buses being hired to take them to parades these uniforms were being made they were buying food or having them catered and all this kind of stuff so it was a really interesting thing for me and so i decided for a couple of summers to to basically attach myself to some of these bands and follow them around during the summer and photograph the parades and and that project emerged as, as blood yeah. and thunder you can find that on bloodandthunderbands.com if you're interested in looking at yeah. it the name itself comes from simply um the, the more traditional drums which you know i have to say it's not all roast into glasses you know a lot of times these bands the way that they play is quite aggressive it's designed yeah. actually to to kind of try it try and intimidate you know whether that's sort of politically or whether it's just literally intimidate your ears but yeah. the, the, the the thunder comes from the noise of the drum uh, and the blood uh, is is comes from the, the knuckles, you know, of the of the bass drummer because you know he, he is beating the drum so hard that his knuckles start to bleed. And actually, blood and thunder bands in particular, you know, was was a was a style very very pared down, very simple tunes, but really all about, you know, I suppose the, the best the most American term I can think of to contextualize would be this kind of shock and awe, you know, this this just like mm. this sort of tsunami of noise coming at you know. So there was very little subtlety about it but mm -hmm. I think for me it was just interesting because I think in my life generally but also I think in, in my photography sometimes it's it's interesting to to kind of look at um phenomena that maybe people or certain sections of people have one idea about and trying to kind of look at it in a different way you know yeah and I think that sort of also links then to to delving into this identity of my own as, as a, someone who grew up as an Ulster Protestant, but yeah. has kind of moved away from that because it is always going to be part of you. Of and course. it's not something that I have any interest in erasing, but it's also a culture or certainly aspects of that culture, which are still prevalent today are something that I personally don't want to subscribe to and don't want to be associated with. Mm. And so I think that's maybe where that sort of liminal space comes in, where you're kind of neither one nor the other, you know, you're in yeah. this kind of permanent transition or limbo. Great. Um, I wonder then, could we talk a li little bit, a little bit about the research you're doing at the minute, and how that maybe builds on on the work you've done in the past? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I I'm currently doing a PhD. I'm in my second year of PhD part time, so I've done one academic year at the moment, and um, uh, I'm doing it through what's it's it's known as a PhD in creative practice. So the, the main output of my thesis will be you know a body of photographic work. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking at is is what's known as as an orange hall. Um, it's not literally orange, but it, th these are halls that are right across the country. And, and as I've already talked about, the orange order it probably makes a little bit more sense. But they're basically mm -hmm. meeting places, traditional meeting places for um, for the orange order. So they would have been in, in perhaps more rural areas, also been so, you know just a community hall, mm -hmm. but they are specifically attached to the orange order, um, and. There's actually about 700 uh, in Ireland, about 650 in what's known as Northern Ireland and about 50 in, in the Republic of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I've always been just visually fascinated with them because they're everywhere. And I think not necessarily everyone notices them because I think, again, depends on your upbringing and what you're familiar with. You know, if you're able to kind of read certain signs that, that indicate what they are. Uh, some cases they're they're slightly hidden. In other cases, they're heavily fortified because they are a target often for vandalism and for arson mm -hmm. from from um, from other sides of uh, from different communities in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, often I think uh, the way I've described them often in, in rural areas, in particular, is, is just looks like they they look like they've fallen from space. Mm 
Mm. Uh, you know, they just don't seem to necessarily connect aesthetically and architecturally with the with the, this mm -hmm. bucolic uh, Irish landscape. And yet they're very much a fundamental and, and, and uh, integral part, I think, of, of Irish history as well. You know, the Orange Order was, was formed in 1795. Um, it's, it's a problematic organization, I would say, in many ways. It's, it's, it's all male or ex pretty much exclusively male. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it does require a profession of, of Christianity to join. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's certainly not a diverse organization. Um, uh, very conservative. And so, again, I've always had this fascination because there would be links in my family with this organization historically, but it's not something that I grew up in or something that I would ever be joining. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm doing at the moment is actually creating an archive of these orange halls and I'm photographing them from the outside. <laughs> you may not be surprised to hear, but I'm mm -hmm. photographing the exteriors. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is by looking at this vernacular architecture and kind of to create a typology of it, you know, things that are familiar or sorry, not familiar, but um, common visual threads that I, when I'm photographing the halls is to kind of create this typology. And then what I'm trying to do is also write around that and look at how perhaps they might um, provide a better idea of my own hybrid sort of Protestant identity. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what my current research is now. It's the first year of a PhD. So I've been told many times that, you know, PhDs can change direction and, and things can suddenly look very different as, as you progress through it. But certainly at the moment, mm -hmm. it's very much looking at the architecture of, of these halls and then trying to link that to, to my own personal Protestant identity and seeing how, um, you know, it can be expressed through through this photographic work. Yeah, it's, it's interesting all that you've said, but interesting also for me, I suppose, in that I, I come from Cavan, which mm. of course is one of the nine counties of Ulster, but one of the counties of Ulster, which is in the Republic of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of the orange halls you've you've been looking at are quite near to where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's definitely something I haven't been aware of, really. And um, so hearing you talk about it is is really interesting and interesting as well that I feel most people where I'm from are not that aware of these buildings. I don't know yeah, of, the, yeah. of the history that is there, and it's not it's not it's not something that's a million years ago either. It's it's quite current. Oh yes, and I way. mean, and and to go back to the vanishing thing, I mean, again, and I suppose you know, as a call back to your to your question about links and and threads and the work, you know, these are also I would say I would say you know, orangeism as a as a an idea is probably a, it's a diminishing culture. You know, membership is decreasing year on year. Um, you know, as society becomes increasingly progressive and diverse, it really is, it's going to be hard, I would say, to find a place for it in, in, mm -hmm. in you know, 30, 40, 50 years down the line. And so yeah. as a result, you know, a lot of these buildings are, are changing. You know, some of them are falling into disrepair. Some are being reclaimed by nature. Some are, mm -hmm. are kind of moving with the times and they're being um, used as, as daycare centers from Monday to Friday. Mm hmm. Uh, you know, some of them are being opened as as places for um, Irish dancing classes, interestingly, or Zumba uh, or keep fit classes, dog training classes. And so, you know, in order to maintain them just as a as a building in itself, regardless of the use, um, th there are sort of changes of foot in terms of the, the cavern halls that you mentioned. You know, interestingly, in the three counties in the Republic of Ireland, which are part of the traditional Protestant nine county uh, province of Ulster, uh, Monaghan, Cavan and Donegal, uh, a lot of the halls there are not marked at all. So actually it's even harder to identify them unless you know what you're looking for because they don't necessarily have any outward uh, identification of what they're used for, um, which I think is, is kind of interesting in itself because as, as you well know, uh, just by an accident of history back in the 20s, you know, you could have been living in, in Cavan as a, as, a, as a Protestant, as an orange man. Um, and, you know, perhaps you were loyal to, to the crown, to, to the, the, the king of England. Um, and overnight, suddenly you were a citizen of a different state and you were expected to have a different allegiance. And also, of course, what became essentially, you know, a, a Catholic state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so so those three counties are very interesting. And again, that goes back to that, I suppose, that liminality and that interstitial spaces where you're uh, kind of 
stuck in the middle between between two things, you know, and it's hard to know how to navigate that, particularly when that decision's been made, you know, by external forces. Yeah, of course. And I suppose that gives me a nice segue to talk about another thing in that uh, we've talked about transitions as a team in your work and, and about all the issues around the border. And I wonder, while you're conducting your current research and with all that's currently happening in the politics of both Ireland and of Britain and of the wider world with relation to Brexit, what are the themes or transitions or issues that are attracting your attention, if if any, I suppose? Well, I mean, I suppose... I suppose one... one thing is is this idea of the border and I I haven't done any work specifically on the border there are some fantastic projects on the Irish border but obviously with the current debate around Brexit you know a lot of it is to do with uh, and a lot of the complications and problems and the reasons why fundamentally Brexit can't work is because you know enshrined in in the Good Friday Agreement is this idea of not having a hard border what's known as a hard border so you would understand that as, say, the US-Mexican border, where you have to go through formal security procedures, you have to present identification. And I think a lot of people will be surprised for all the talk of the border. When you drive from Belfast to Dublin, there is no border. The only way to really see that border is by watching yourself cross it on Google Maps. And often certain border roads, you can actually cross it multiple times back and forward between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland on the same road. Uh, the only other indications really are the the signs changed from miles per hour to kilometers per hour. So um, I think that's kind of an an interesting aspect, I suppose, of Brexit. And, and some people have explored that, you know, photographically. There's one particular project recently by a photographer called Tristan Poyser, um, you know, and uh, he's done a very interesting sort of participatory project around that and people giving their impressions and their ideas of the border. Um, which, uh, you know, I recommend uh, definitely. Uh, he's actually an Englishman. So again, it's very interesting for someone uh, from outside Ireland to be exploring this idea of the border. I suppose from for myself, you know, um, I, I'm thinking in some cases of, you know, Orange Halls, this idea of them being a border within themselves, because obviously they are an exclusive space. They're claiming a piece of land and there is no access in. And what, one of the interesting things about Orange Halls photographically is that, they have very common features and uh, often halls have uh, windows, but the windows are bricked up or cemented up. Uh, they're covered with very heavy duty steel gates. A lot of the doors themselves don't have any handles on the outside. So there's this idea that, that you know, that quite often there's maybe only one or two points of access, despite the fact that there are visibly lots of points of access. So uh, to me, that's kind of fascinating, this idea that it's it's creating this sort of you know, tiny border where, you know, you can only access with, by being granted permission. But I think, you know, in a, Northern Ireland and particularly the cities in Northern Ireland, but you can see this right across the six counties that, that is known as Northern Ireland, you know, borders, it's all about borders. You know, the whole mm -hmm. country is is often very subtly, but it's it's de it's delineated along political and religious, religious mm -hmm. lines. You know, mm -hmm. if you drive through Belfast, you can tell very quickly um, which areas you're in because often um, there will be a lot more Irish language uh, which would indicate you're in a nationalist or republican area um, and those areas for those who don't know are areas that would predominantly favour being part of United Ireland. Similarly if you drive to an area where there's Northern Ireland flags where there's United Kingdom flags or curb stones are painted red white and blue uh, you know these are all indications that you're you're in a, a, a loyalist or a unionist leaning area. And those are those are traditionally Protestant areas which would favor being part of the United Kingdom and would define themselves quite often as British mm. or Northern Irish. And so that that aspect of borders is, is something that in Northern Ireland we're very used to because not only do we have the, the literal political border on the island of Ireland, but we also have uh, you know the sea border which which is surrounds us. So although we're part of the United Kingdom, uh, politically, in terms of the jur legal jurisdiction, we still have to cross uh, the ocean to get there. Mm. And then obviously within the cities and, and, and the countryside of, of Northern Ireland itself, there are these markers and, you know, they're often very, very close to each other. You know, you can turn a corner, uh, go across a street and you can go from a Protestant area into a Catholic area very quickly. And again, there are parts of Belfast that are still divided by these 
so-called peace walls, which are actually separating communities from each other. Yes. Um, and interestingly, since the Good Friday Agreement, since the since the peace process, these interfaces, these peace walls have actually increased rather than decreased. So I think there's a fascinating um, possibilities there. One thing that I'm looking at at the moment is flags. It's, it's currently July 2022. Um, and as this Protestant marching season uh, reaches its peak on, on the 12th of July, 12th and 13th of July, you suddenly see a lot more flags around Belfast in Protestant areas. Mm. Uh, and so I've been starting to look at these and photograph these and trying to perhaps, um, they are very loaded politically. They do have, in some cases, perhaps an intimidating, um, you know, feel to them, you know, because they are delineating yes. and marking out areas. So I'm trying to look at ways photographically to explore that and, and perhaps take away some of that power yeah. and give it a kind of a, a different aesthetic look. Uh, so that it, it's making it perhaps more universal. Um, yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I, I saw looking at your project on, on on the flags. One thing you mention is perhaps photographing the shadows of flags as a way of maybe erasing some of the symbolic and sectarian meaning that they have. And one thing you mentioned is that it makes the when you're photographing the shadows, it makes them indistinguishable really from flags er everywhere, and. I thought that was an interesting thing when I read it for the reason that I suppose it underlines or, or kind of pushes us towards remembering, you know, the universal nature of some of these questions that there's obviously there's particular issues about Northern Ireland and, and, and identity there. But then you can look at identity elsewhere and how it compares to that and maybe the, the universality in a way of some of these questions of identity. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I think ultimately, I suppose that in some ways, without, you know, not acknowledging very real concerns or very real things that people, you know, that need to be addressed, you know, is is that, I suppose, that indis indistinguishability, mm -hmm. you know, and I suppose with the flag work, that's kind of the idea, because this is something that is 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 put up at a certain time of year, and it's meant to send a very distinct message, and you can almost create something beautiful from that and something more powerful actually than it is originally, I suppose, mm. um, by making it indistinguishable, you know, by taking out the color, by taking out the, the, sim the symbolism, by taking out the political hue. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in Northern Ireland, and I suppose across Ireland, uh, and I suppose even by extension, the UK, you know, this, there is an obsession, I suppose, with, with class, you know, with religion, with political background. I mean, in Northern Ireland, you know, even what school you go to or what your name is, you know, is these are all markers in this society of where you're from mm. and what potentially your political views might be. Yeah. And I suppose as generations uh, pass, you know, those things perhaps weaken, but they're still very much a, a part of the society. And I think at times like this, where, you know, economically it's difficult you know, post pandemic, all these things, you know, increasingly people do cling to to these, you know, the, what we know and the safety and numbers and stick yeah. to your own. And, you know, that that I suppose, you know, is maybe a way of trying to counter that, you know, yeah. and actually, you know, pushing or at least focusing on, on those commonalities as well as yeah. just like all these distinctions that, you know, as you know yourself, we're obsessed with in Ireland, you know. Yeah, of course. And it's funny, you mentioned there the different things that can indicate to you maybe that you're crossing a kind of a boundary between communities in, in Northern Ireland. And one of the things you mentioned was you'd see more Irish, Irish language written and maybe Irish language signs. And of course, my role here at Villanova is <laughs> all to do with the Irish language. I'm That's my uh, purpose here. I'm, I'm teaching and promoting the Irish language here. And you know, it's it's obviously something that is important to me, but it's also something I understand has a lot of political resonances and is not is not really a neutral question in terms of its significance for identity. I noticed also when I was looking at your website that you use some Irish in, in titles for your work. So you've um, tabbed there on the website and you've got Ulla, which is, of course, the Irish language for Ulster. So it's Ulla Ulster and Belfast Bail Fereste, using the Irish language place names. And I'm wondering, what's your reason for that? And 
how do you feel you know the Irish language has relevance to some of the the research and things you're you're looking into well I suppose uh, you know because I think it's a reflection of of my own identity because you know I am a citizen of two states Mm. and but but equally I don't feel part of either and in some ways you know I don't feel comfortable saying, well, I'm British because I don't think there's such a thing, really. I don't think British is really an identity, per se. Mm. Similarly, you know, I'm a citizen of the Republic of Ireland, but, you know, as I explained when I went to Japan, I wasn't always and sometimes still, I'm not comfortable just saying I'm Irish, you know, and Mm. and there is increasingly in Northern Ireland a group, a section of the population who are defining themselves as Northern Irish, you know, because Mm. it does take in various elements of both those things and I think often particularly in America you know it's been portrayed as a very binary black and white situation and and it really isn't I think it's more nuanced than that you know Um, I think for me you know I've always had a fascination with the Irish language because I mean you know again as you know um, the Irish language belongs to everyone in the the island of Ireland and Mm. you know there is a great book called How Protestants Saved the Irish Language, which really, you know, really spoke to my kind of confrontational personality. But, you know, uh, Irish language at one point was really in um, in danger of becoming um, a dead language in, in the way that, say, perhaps Manx has on the Isle of Man. And, mm. you know, there were Protestant clerics in particular who were very heavily involved in the promotion of the Irish language. And, I mean, that just shows you because... Obviously, since particularly since the late sixties in Northern Ireland, um, uh, Irish has become really politicised, you know, and mm. it's become associated with a Catholic Republican nationalism, um, and so what that has resulted in, I suppose, is is Protestants viewing it with suspicion, viewing it with um, fear, mm. and you know, to the point where you know there is um, a desire here. Uh, by large sections of the population for an Irish language act to make it to give it parity with English in Northern Ireland Mm. and it collapsed the government several years ago because people could not agree on it and the reason for that is I suppose a lack of understanding of the history of Irish but also the fact that it has been claimed and become associated with one section of the population and I think that's such a shame and I suppose for me uh, you know, having lived overseas and then obviously come back and, uh, and as you know, in, intermittently tried to learn Irish uh, uh, rather unsuccessfully. I think, you know, there's no reason why Protestants should not access. And there is an increasing number of Protestants uh, learning Irish language because even every place name that's been anglicised obviously comes from the Irish language. And I just think that's a real shame. So for me, um, it's. I suppose it's about kind of reclaiming that in some ways. Now, I don't have a, a great understanding or, or any real fluency or, or ability in the language, but mm. if you're able even just to use some of that language to kind of mm. uh, indicate that ambiguity, um, which comes with a lot of these things. I mean, Ulster in particular is very interesting, I think, because, you know, you mentioned before that you're from Cavan, which is in the traditional nine county province of Ulster. But yes. in, the, in the 1920s, when Northern Ireland was created, it did not, including the three additional counties in Ulster, Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal would have created um, a state which didn't have a Protestant majority and so politically yeah. would have been unsustainable. So those three con- counties were, were cut loose, you know, mm. and actually the way that Ulster is often talked about um, in Northern Ireland, it, it, it's synonymous with Northern Ireland. So a lot of Protestants will use Ulster as a synonym for Northern Ireland. But of course, strangely, that's not actually a real place. You know, know. a six county Ulster doesn't really exist. Mm-hmm. And it's a kind of a creation in, in the 20s. And, and uh, you know, I think that for me is, is a really fascinating uh, idea, this kind of country that doesn't actually really exist. Certainly, yeah, it's um, something that there's lots of food for thought there, I, I, I'd say. I'm, I'm conscious, Philip, just I, I feel we're giving our poor editor a, a lot of work in, in cutting down what we're saying because the conversation is is going so well and so Tell them not to cut it down, just keep yeah. it all in, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll have to make, we can make a strong argument for that. Now, before, just as a, as a closing topic of conversation, of course, this podcast is the Villanova Center, Villanova University Center for Irish Studies. is It's our podcast. So we spoke. Me and you have spoken in the past about Ulster Scots identity or Scotch Irish identity in the US, and how this is no longer recognized a recognized identity on US census forms. And of course, 
many of the US presidents who, you know, might be described as Irish historically are, are actually Ulster Scots or Scotch Irish. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that as, as a thing that has happened as a, as a change, historical change, and what it means that now that identity isn't something that you can describe yourself on, describe yourself as on US census forms. Yeah, I think it's interesting in the sense that, you know, I suppose the, 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 what we consider the classic sort of Irish American, you know, it tends to be associated with that latter wave of immigration, which, you know, from the famine onwards, you know, that, that gave us the Kennedys, for example. But as you say, a lot of Ulster Scots, so they would have been Protestant people, a lot of Presbyterians would have emigrated to, to America, you know, back in the 1700s. And I suppose the fact that it's removed from the census form is interesting in the sense that it's obviously become so embedded with the sense of just being an American or at least, a, you know, an immigrant American that it's, it's no longer sort of a category that makes any sense. What, what's interesting about it as well as, as opposed to, say, Polish Americans or, or um, Italian Americans is that to call yourself an, an Ulster Irish American or an Ulster Scots American is that it's not really, again, a, a country, right? Mm. You know, um, uh, back then it would have been Ireland. You were coming from Ireland, but, you know, and, and you may well have defined yourself as Irish, but, you, you know, you very much had this Ulster Scots identity. You know, a lot of the uh, people who had come to settle in Northern Ireland or to, to in some cases, to plant Northern Ireland, um, from Cromwell onwards would have uh, been Scots speakers, you know, they would have been uh, Presbyterians in particular. Um, and so I think that's just, it's just interesting that um, whether or not there's a demand or not to, to, to identify yourself that as I don't know, but ironically in Northern Ireland, uh, around the same time of, uh, again, of, of post, uh, pre and post Good Friday Agreement, there was this revival of this Ulster Scots identity. And again, it's quite contentious because one of the reasons people would argue that it's been created or it's been highlighted is, is a, as a counterpoint to Irish, mm. because this idea of Irish language and Irish identity has been politicized. And so there was this need to, well, you know, you have Irish language, we have Ulster Scots. Now, there's no point in getting into a linguistic debate, but mm. some people mm. would say that it's not necessarily a language, it's more of a mm. dialect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's only spoken again in certain areas of, of, of what's known as Northern Ireland. So um, I think it's fascinating that as that disappeared in America, it's been revived here, you know, yes. uh, two, three hundred years later uh, for political reasons. Mm. The other thing I suppose is interesting is that, you know, the, the only option really now is to identify yourself as an Irish American on the census. And not that there's any problem with that. But yeah. again, you know, as I've described already, there are questions and uh, complications in Northern Ireland in particular as defining yourself as Irish, particularly if you come from uh, a Protestant background, not to say you can't, but not everyone mm. will feel comfortable with that, but mm. there's no other option now um, in terms of, so in, in a strange way, the Scots-Irish or the Ulster Scots have just become Americans in some way, yeah. you know, and don't have that prefix that is so beloved by by, by many people in America, you know, to highlight and to identify their their original heritage. Yeah. Yeah. All fascinating, Philip. Um, to close, I wonder, first of all, to thank you very much for talking with me this evening. And uh, I hope everybody who listens enjoys the conversation as much as I did. If people want to find you, how can they go about that? You can find me at uh, philiparneal.com. It's a bit of a tricky one to spell, but it's... P-H-I-L-I-P, -I -I and my surname is A-R-N-E-I-L-L.com. And all my work is there. If you want to uh, find me on Instagram, it's just at Philip Arneal. And if you're interested specifically in the Tokyo Jazz Joints project, it has its own website, uh, and it's just tokyojazzjoints.com. So please, yeah, if you're interested. And uh, if anything that we've talked about today, or uh, you're interested in talking more about it, or just, you know, whatever, please, please do feel free to, to DM me or send me an email and uh, I'd be delighted to chat more. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Philip. And so with that, we will bring this episode to a close. And I'd like to thank you all again for, for listening and, you know, keep tuned to the Villanova Irish Studies podcast for more interesting conversations. Thank you very much. Garamil Mahagi.
Slán.